Okay, I'm going to be covering section 7.3, which is about converting statements into categorical form. So here's the idea. Um, we have an argument, like say somebody arguing for capital punishment, arguing, arguing in favor of it on the grounds that it deters crime. Okay, that's a fine argument. Well, we need to work out, first of all, what they're probably saying. It's probably something more like this. Capital punishment deters crime. Two, we should do whatever we can to deter crime. And three, therefore, we should use capital punishment. Again, that's a fine argument, but it's hard to analyze using categorical logic because it's not in categorical statements. There's no all some, some not, or none. So the idea is that we can turn arguments like this into categorical arguments with just a little bit of work. So for example, in this case, we end up with this, which is sort of ugly, but at least is a categorical syllogism in standard order. We end up with something like this. One, all things that deter crime are things that we should do. All capital punishments are things that deter crime, and therefore all capital punishments are things that we should do. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, would be AAA1, which would be valid. Okay. There's three th kinds of things that can go wrong when you've got an argument and you're trying to turn it into, you're trying to look at it in categorical terms. They're called three deviations. So the first deviation, the first way that something can go wrong is when the argument's not in standard order. For example, we already saw things like this in section uh, 6.2. It says some evergreens are objects of worship because all fir trees are evergreens and some objects of worship are fir trees. Here we have three different statements that are all categorical statements. They're all some statements, or well, two of them are some statements and one is an all statement, but they're not in the right order. So we had to put them in the right order and we ended up with something like this. One, some objects of worship are fir trees. Two, all fir trees are evergreens. Three, therefore, some evergreens are objects of worship. And that would be a categorical syllogism in standard order. So the first deviation is when you just need to put things in order, and we've already talked about that. That's covered in 6.2. The second deviation is when the argument has too many terms. An example, a first example is if you had a bunch of synonyms like this one. This is in 7.2. One, no wealthy persons are vagrants. Two, all lawyers are rich people. Three, therefore no attorneys are tramps. Now if you look at this, we have terms for wealthy persons, rich people, vagrants, tramps, lawyers, and attorneys. But the first two of those, wealthy persons and rich people, in this context, really mean the same thing. And the second two of those, vagrants and tramps, in this context, really mean the same thing. And again, lawyers and attorneys really mean the same thing. So even though this has six different terms, it's really still only talking about three different things. And that means we should be able to turn it into a legitimate syllogism. It would look something like this. No wealthy persons are vagrants. All lawyers are wealthy persons. Therefore, no lawyers are vagrants. What I've done is just taken the phrase wealthy persons and substituted it for rich people so that everywhere we talk about it, we use the same phrase. Okay, that's called the second deviation. Here's another more complicated example. This is where you have antonyms. Here I have all mammals are warm-blooded animals. Therefore, no lizards are warm-blooded animals. Therefore, all lizards are non-mammals. So in statement one, I have mammals. In statement two, or three, I have the opposite, non-mammals. And then warm-blooded animals are in both places and lizards are in two places. So you can actually turn this into categorical syllogism too with some careful work. You end up with something like this. All mammals are warm-blooded animals. No lizards are warm-blooded animals. Therefore, no lizards are mammals. We've changed the third statement so that we can use just the word mammals in both places. Now, you don't have to know how to do that for this test. Uh, I just wanted to mention it. It's in 7.2. What, we, what we, you will have to do for this test is the third, handle things in the third deviation. So the third devi deviation is when the individual statements are just not in categorical form at all. Like our first example, we should do whatever we can to deter crime. There's no all, some, some, not, or none there. But we can turn it into one. We can say that means that anything we can do is something to, to deter crime is something we should do. So we end up with something like this. All things that deter crime are things that we should do. And that's a categorical statement. So that's what we're going to be looking at. That's, this is all in section 7.3. Now section 7.3 has nine guidelines for translating individual statements into categorical form. That is, it has nine kinds of things you can encounter and how to handle each one of them. 
Uh, a semester or two ago, I called these nine rules, but I don't like calling them rules because they don't feel like rules when you use them. As you use them, you have to keep using your judgment on exactly how to do what. And so it's probably better just to think of them as guidelines or ideas or techniques that you can use. So think of them as nine techniques, maybe, would be another word. Anyway, here they are. The book goes through them in this order. I don't like going through them in this order because the first one is one of the most complicated ones there is. I'd like starting with the second one. So I'm going to go through in a, in a slightly different order than the book does. Um, but we'll eventually hit all nine of these. Our goal, remember, is to turn things into categorical statements. And every categorical statement is a quantifier, like all some, some are some not, followed by a subject, followed by a copula, that is, is, are, was, were, will be, some sort of form of the verb to be followed by a predicate. And the subject and the predicate both have to be things or groups of things, uh, nouns or noun phrases. All politicians are liars. Politicians is a, is a group of things. Liars is a group of things. So that's the, that's the form we're looking for. So let's start with the first example, adjectives. This is number two in the book. Um, remember, we're aiming at quantifier, subject, copula, and predicate. And the predicate has to be a noun or a noun phrase. So one of the things that you get is something that doesn't fit that, like this statement, which is nearly categorically uh, correct. It says, all cats are black. The prob problem with this, the all is fine, the cats are fine, the are is fine, but black is not a group of things. Black is just an adjective. So it's easy to fix. We just say, all cats are black things. Or maybe all cats are black animals, or even all cats are black cats. The point is we have to not just have the adjective black, we have to have things, black things, black animals, black cats, black creatures, black objects, whatever you want to use that has the same meaning as the original. So instead of saying all cats are black, we'll say all cats are black things. This might seem picky, and in this case it maybe is because everybody would know exactly what you meant. But when we get to more complicated cases, it'll be important to be really specific about them. So I'm going to insist on this part of the test and in the quizzes that if you see something like this, that you remember to change ad adjectives into nouns or noun phrases like this. Here's a more complicated example. No warships are available for active duty. The problem here is that available for active duty is not a class of things. It's a, it's a description. So we need something like no warships are things that are available for active duty. Or you could have said no warships are ships that are available for active duty. Something like that. Okay. By the way, almost all the examples I'm using actually come from the textbook in 7.3. So you'll find most of the same examples there. The third thing we need to think about is, uh, or the next thing we need to talk about, which is number three in the book, is wrong verbs. Instead of, instead of, where, instead of the copula is or are or whatever, we have something else. So an example is this statement, all people seek recognition. We've got an all, we've got a people, we've got recognition. Those are all the right kind of thing. But seek is supposed to be is or are. So we're going to say all people are something. But, but that's gonna, how do we get seeking in there? Well, we do it by, by moving the verb seek into the predicate. So we get something like this. All people are recognition seekers. Or maybe all people are people who seek recognition, whatever seems more comfortable for you. So notice that we're putting the, word, the copula back in there. All people are, uh, some people are, no people are. And then we put the word seek used to be part of the verb. Now it moves into the predicate, people who seek or recognition seekers. Here's another example that the book uses. Some people drink Greek wine. So that some people are what? Some people are Greek wine drinkers. So these two are pretty straightforward. Know how to do those. Four deals with the quantifier. Being things in the, things being in the wrong order. So here's a, here, this is a little trickier because you have to stop and think about the meaning of the statement. You can't just sort of do it mechanically. So example number one in the book is racehorses are all thoroughbreds. The problem here is that the word all is supposed to be at the front. So the question you have to ask is, how is it supposed to be arranged? Should it be all races, racehorses are thoroughbreds or should it be all thoroughbreds are racehorses? Which one is this actually saying? Should the all attach to the racehorses and we just should move it up in front? Or is the all supposed to stay attached to the thoroughbreds? And you have to ask what it means. So when they say racehorses are all thoroughbreds, are they saying all the races horses are thoroughbreds? Or are they saying all the thoroughbreds there are are racehorses? And if you think about it, they're saying the first one. They're saying every racehorse is a thoroughbred. But for various reasons, they've moved the word all to the end of the state, almost to the end of the sentence, even though it's actually attaching to racehorses. And how do you know that? You just have to think about the meaning of it. And uh, what, what would you expect it to mean? Here's another complicated example. 
all's well that ends well. Here, there's two things we're talking about. We're talking about the things that end well, and we're talking about the things that actually are well. And what this means is, this is a statement that means if everything ends up okay, then it was fine. Don't worry about it. Somebody says, oh, I'm so worried about such and such. And somebody else says, don't worry, it turned out all right. Because everything that turns out all right is okay. So things that end well are well. So that's the question we have to ask. Is this saying all things that are well are things that end well? Or is it saying all things that end well are things that are well? And as I just explained, it's saying, hey, if something ends well, that's okay. That means it turned out, uh, it was fine. So we're saying all things that end well are things that are well. That sounds really awkward, but that at least is in categorical form so that we can use it with all our other um, understanding of categorical syllogisms. All right. Number five is also about the quantifier. Actually, five and seven I'm going to do together. Five is about having the wrong quantifier, and seven is about not having a quantifier at all in the book. Uh, so here's an example of the wrong quantifier. Uh, somebody says, every dog has his day. Um, that's a saying. And uh, it means that, that every, every dog eventually has something, a day that's like good for him. Everybody gets their moment of fame or their moment of success or whatever else. All right, so the problem here is that we say every instead of, instead of all, but it's pretty clear how this should be changed. It should be all dogs have their day. And actually we have to change the verb too. So it's all dogs are creatures that have their day. So there, every means all. This might be a little trickier. What does any mean? Does it mean all or does it mean some? Well, if you think about it, you're only talking about one contribution at a time, but you're still saying that every single contribution, no matter which one, who it came from and how small it was, would be appreciated. So you're saying that all contributions will be appreciated. And that's why this would be something like all contributions are appreciated things. So here the word any, and you might not have expected this, actually means all. So sometimes things will mean none or some. You have to just stop and think about the meaning. Here's the tricky one. The word a, a bat, a, that word can be a quantifier also. If I say a bat is a mammal, do I mean that all bats are mammals? Or do I mean that certain bats are mammals, that some bats are mammals? Well, when somebody says a bat is a mammal, they mean a bat in general. They mean anything that's a bat. So they're actually talking about every bat that ever exists being a mammal. So they mean all bats are mammals. But on the other hand, if somebody says the bat flew in my window, what do, they mean by, what do they mean by the? Do they mean all bats flew in my window? Or do they mean some bats flew in my window? <laughs> or some bat? Well, they probably mean a certain bat flew in my window. They didn't mean every single bat flew in my window that ever existed. So sometimes people say something like a bat and they just mean a single one. A bat flew in my window. A bat is over there. A bat is above us. Sometimes they mean the bat or a bat in general. A bat is a mammal. The bat is able to fly. The bat has echolocation. And by that, we mean the bat in general or a bat in general. So we mean all. So you have to think about how words like a uh and the are used. If they mean everything in the, entire, in the entire category, then they're used as all. If they mean just certain things in the category, then they're used as some. And the same thing happens when you have no quantifier. If I say elephants are big, that could either mean all elephants are big or some elephant is big or some elephants are big. But if you think about it, it means all elephants are big. And yet, if somebody else says elephants are parading down the street, they could either mean all elephants are parading down the street or some elephants are parading down the street, but clearly they just mean some elephants. They don't mean every single element ever. So sometimes when people say something like elephants are big, they mean every single element elephant ever, and they mean it as an all. Sometimes when people say something like elephants are parading down the street, they mean it just about certain elephants or whatever else the noun is. So wrong quantifier, no quantifier, needs to be translated into the right kind of quantifier, all or some usually, and it sort of depends on the context. Exclusive propositions are a little bit technical, so take a, close, uh, take a careful note of this one. This one you need to really watch for. You're likely to get it wrong otherwise. This is where you have a word like only. Only citizens can vote. So we're not just saying the citizens can vote, we're saying they're the only ones who can vote. Now you might be tempted to turn this into an all statement, all citizens can vote, but that's not correct. By the way, one reason that's not correct is because we don't have the right verb. We should say all citizens are people who can vote. But again, that's wrong. That's not what this means. This doesn't say that every citizen can vote. It says that only citizens can vote. So the better way to say this is to reverse citizens and people who can vote and say it this way. All people who can vote 
are citizens. What we've done is moved citizens to the back and people who can vote, vote to the front, and that is what this statement means. Think about the meaning. Only citizens can vote is the same as saying all the people who can vote are citizens. And that's the right way to do this. You swap the two, the subject and the predicate, and use an all instead. So that's the way it will always work with an only. Only is an all with the predicate and the subject swapped. If you just learn that pattern, that will be easy. If you don't, it's easy to get this one wrong. Finally, there's a category in the book for miscellaneous, and then we'll move on to the hard ones after this. Miscellaneous just means everything else they didn't have a category for. So here's four quick examples taken from the book. Number one, not all children believe in Santa Claus. Not all is uh, not the same as all. And if you try to translate it as somehow all, somehow as an all statement, it's going to be hard to do. You can't say no children believe in Santa Claus because that's not what this is saying. But you can translate it using some not. Some children are not people who believe in Santa Claus. There are white elephants. Well, again, if you try to make the predicate white elephants, it's not quite clear what the subject should be. All what are white elephants, or some what, or some things are white elephants might work. That's one way you can translate this. But another way you can translate it is just to say some elephants are white things. Some elephants are white. And there are no pink elephants would be no elephants are pink. Or no, no elephants are pink things. Uh, nothing is both round and square. Could be no things are round and square things, but it's probably just as easy to say no round things are square things, or no square things are round things. So with miscellaneous things, you just have to stop and figure out how to translate them. All right, now we come to the two tricky ones. Singular propositions and exceptive propositions. Now don't mix up number six, exclusive propositions, which is only, and nine, exceptive propositions, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Let me talk about singular propositions first. That's number one in the book. They give an example of Socrates, so let me use the example Socrates as a philosopher, and let me also use the example this table is an antique. Now these are both called singular propositions because the subject, Socrates, or this table, are both talking about only one thing, one single thing. There's only one Socrates that we're talking about, and we're saying he's a philosopher. There's only one table, which is this table, and we're saying this table is an antique. Now, when I say Socrates is a philosopher here, you're supposed to understand that I don't just mean anybody ever called Socrates. I mean the, the Socrates that we always think about if we think about philosophy. So Socrates, there's only one. This table, there's only one. That's what makes these singular propositions. And uh, they're sort of hard to figure out how to translate. Do you talk about all the Socrateses there are or just some Socrateses? There's only one. It's sort of hard to distinguish between all and some. And that's the point. Does Socrates as a philosopher mean, uh, well, if there's only one Socrates, we could try either some Socrates as a philosopher or we could try all the people who are Socrates are philosophers. But it sort of means the same thing because there is only one Socrates who's a philosopher. So that is all the people who are Socrates. It's just him. So which one is the meaning? And the answer is both are true. And so the answer you should give me on a test is both sentences. If I say, what is the categorical version of Socrates as a philosopher? You should give me both sentences as your answer. You should say it means both that some Socrates is a philosopher and that all the people who are Socrates are philosophers. Now, if you're using this in real life, you don't use both. In real life, what you do is you use whichever one's helpful. Since it means them both, you get to take your pick. But on the test, you'll give me both as an answer. Same thing with the table. This table is an antique, means both some table, which is this one, is an antique table, and all tables, which are this one, are antique tables. So give both sentences as your answer. That's weird, I know, but that's how this goes. In real life applications, you use whichever one is helpful. All right, exclusive, acceptive propositions, not exclusive, that's number six, and it's the only. Acceptive propositions are number nine in the book, and they're also the same way in that you give two answers, but there's a couple different kinds of acceptive propositions that you have to be aware of. So here's one example. All accepted employees are eligible. Everybody's eligible except the employees. Here's another example. Almost all the employees are eligible. This is very different. This says most of the employees are eligible, the first one says the employees are not eligible, but everybody else is. These are both called acceptive propositions, and the key to what makes something an acceptive proposition is that certain people are eligible here and certain people are not. So when we say all accepted employees are eligible, we're actually talking about two different groups of people, the people who are eligible and the people who are not, and we're saying something about how, who's eligible, eligible, and we're saying something else 
about who's not eligible. Actually, a better way to say that, we're saying something about the employees, and we're saying something about non-employees. And down below, also, we're saying that certain people are eligible and certain people are not. We're saying something about the employees who are, and then something else about there being some employees who are not. So in the first case, all accepted employees are eligible. We're saying that certain people are eligible, certain people are not. We're saying something about all the people who are not employees, they are all eligible because everybody except employees are eligible. But we're also saying that the employees are not. So because we're saying two different things, we have two different statements. And just like the singular proposition, you will give me both sentences as your answer on tests and quizzes. Look at the second one, we get the same kind of thing. Certain people are eligible, almost all the employees, so some of the employees definitely are, and certain people are not eligible. Some of the employees aren't eligible, are not eligible. So we have both that some are and that some are not. And both those sentences are, as are true, and you need to give me both sentences as your answer. Because saying that almost all of them are tells me, first of all, that some of them really are, that's the first sentence, but also tells me that some of them are not, that's the second sentence, so it tells me both. So both of them are true, and both of them are part of the answer. Now, it also tells me even more than that. It tells me that there's more empl eligible employees than non-eligible ones, but that's very hard to capture in categorical statements, so we won't even try. <laughs> So, but we will at least use these two. So if I give you an acceptive example, which might not use these words, it might be very different. You should look in the book for all the different examples, but this is the way you'd answer it. Okay, I believe that's all. Yep, and so I'll end there. Thank you.